Hello and welcome to the Wicked Things Podcast. We present to you Stadler House Book 2 Emily. How would you move on if you suffered the terrible loss of your family at a friend's hand? That is what Emily Stevens has been trying to do for almost two decades, but her past seems hell-bent on haunting her till her dying days. She has continued to suffer and now finds herself locked away in a mental health facility. Dr. Stadler, hypnotized and forced her to forget parts of her past, before his incarceration. Dr. Waters, under court orders continues to try and determine if Emily is sane enough to stand trial for murder. Rodney, has moved on as one of the two survivors of the Stadler House Massacre. But it seems fate has put him and Emily in a direct path towards one another. Who knows how this will all end or if it will end. Otherworldly forces are clearly at work in this small town of Port St. John, Florida. Emily emerges from the master bedroom, closing the door behind her. Her clothes, torn, frayed, and her eyes are glassy and lifeless. She walks into the living room, focusing on the recliner and James. She growls under her breath, So many lives cut short by this monster. James turns his head to face her, smirking. He knows something's not right about her, but he can sense the familiarity of the change she has undergone. Rough night, girlie. Where's my dinner? Emily enters the living room, clenching her hands into fists. Her face cannot hide her murderous intent. She reaches into her scrub breast pocket and retrieves a handful of scraps of cloth, hair, and worse. She extends her arm and drops his trophies to the floor. I found your trinkets. James squirms, uneasy and nervous, seeing his private belongings tossed to the floor. His face twists and his jaw quivers as he sticks out his bottom jaw like an angry predator in the wild ready to fight. I told you to stay out of the boxes in my bedroom. You had no right. Lightning strikes and thunder booms outside of Mr. Hill's home. The brilliant flash of blue-white light brings into light that which wishes to stay hidden from the world. Looming behind Mr. Hill stands the shadow thing, his inner demon made manifest by its symbiotic relationship with the once proud serial killer. Emily smiles as the entity takes full possession of her body. Anku glares at the demonically possessed elderly man that defeated him previously, but that was because he was unaware of the true nature of his adversary. The entity knows now what they must overcome to escort the dead into the twilight world and ultimately to their final destination. They remember what you did to them. Do you? They will go home with me to where they belong. James and the chair spins to face Emily Anku, dragging heavy gouges in the terrazzo floor. The shadowy creature fades into the body of Mr. Hill. So, you think I am just going to let you walk out of here with my possessions? Did you bring an army? You know, from last time, you can't win on your own against me. Emily Anku lowers her head like a bull set to charge, but rather than rushing at the devil sitting before her, she raises her arms skyward. The entity empowers the ghostly victims of Mr. Hill to manifest through its powers. I am never alone. James scowls at her, and in a burst of movement, he hurls himself through the air, his hands set ready to throttle her by the neck until dead. The strength of the demon filling every fiber of his being in their ultimate reunion of self and true self. One last dance, bitch. The army of vengeful spirits place themselves between Anku, Emily, and demon James. They converge around the demon James and drag him to the floor with a loud thud and the snapping of bones follows his impact. James shakes his head, reeling from the intervention of the spirits. The anger of the demon shakes the foundation of Mr. Hill's home. The windows rattle at first against the surge of wind from outside, 
and the pressure generated by the foul power of the demon. Accompanied by a loud pop and crash, the windows fragment into a shower of thousands of razor-sharp pieces scattering across the floor of the Hill House living room. Anku Emily clenches the fist of its extended arm. The hands of countless souls erupt all around the body of Mr. Hill. They seize his arms and legs, holding him firm to the floor against his struggle. The voice of the entity booms from her mouth, giving orders to the spirits. Separate them. Demon James' eyes widen as images of a painful splitting of the pairing rush through his head. He slips an arm free from the grasp of the wraiths and growls at Emily Anku. The jagged shards of broken glass fly into the air, as if guided by a powerful gust of wind. They race through the air, slicing into the flesh of his adversary. Die! Anku raises Emily's arms to stop the whirlwind of broken glass from striking out her eyes. Instead, the shards of glass tear deep into her flesh, ripping at her arms, legs, and torso. The pieces gouge deep and carve away large sections of meat from Emily's body. She winces as the pain intensifies from the assault. James rages against the army of his ghostly victims. The harder he tries to pull away from their grasp, the more ghostly hands appear. He growls like a caged beast thrashing against his captors. I'll kill you all! Oh. Anku Emily stares down at the once powerful and prolific serial killer laid low by his own tormentors. She plunges her hand through his sternum. The room fills with the loud crunch of his bones. She wiggles her arm, searching for something hidden inside him. You can't hide any longer. Now that I have taken your trophies and the souls freed, you and your powerless, reduced to a doubting voice in the back of his. Anku Emily thrusts her hands up through the chest, past the throat, and coming to a stop in his skull. She grins, feeling her hand tighten around some part of the demon. She rips her arm out of the carcass of Mr. Hill. In her clenched fist, she holds a small floundering black mass spitting and cursing at her. She softly finishes her final thought about the creature. Head. Emily exits the trance-like state of sharing her body with Anku. The overwhelming sensation of pain sweeps over her, sending her crashing to the floor next to the disemboweled remains of Mr. Hill's broken corpse. She gazes down at her body, realizing that she is not in much better shape than the cooling body next to her. As soon as the entity leaves its fusion with Emily, the pain of her injuries hits her full force. She feels the intense sting of every wound on her body. Her thick, warm, and sticky blood clings to both her flesh and tattered clothing. The countless lacerations covering her arms and legs burn as her salty sweat finds its way to each of the open wound's exposed nerves. Losing blood causes her limbs to feel weak and useless. As she lays upon her back, the first golden rays of the new day enter the windowless house and shine down on them both. Emily exhales and closes her eyes, embracing the warming rays of the morning sun. She rolls onto her side, facing Mr. Hill's corpse. What a weekend! You mean old bastard! I hope you're burning in hell for all eternity! A gentle breeze rustles the curtain dangling from the living room window frame. Emily looks to the curtains jostling in the wind and spots Stephanie. She walks across the room and kneels down next to Emily. You can't stay here. The police will be here soon. Now get up and go hide. Dr. Waters rests his elbows on the desktop, separating Emily and him from one another. He places his glasses on the desktop and rubs his eyes. He returns his attention to her and shakes his head. Dr. Waters turns off the recorder. 
So are you sticking with that story, then? Emily coughs into her hand and scowls at Dr. Waters. I knew you would never believe me. No one has, or ever will, I suppose. Dr. Waters scoffs. Not that I don't believe you. I believe that you believe all that happened to you. Emily jerks against her restraints. Then why have me tell you a story that you've already heard and would never believe at all? Huh? Daniel chuckles as he walks around the desk to her side. He sits down at arm's length from her reach. He leans in close to the boundary of the restraints and speaks in a low, soft voice. Well, since you have terrified or assaulted all the doctors who wanted to work with you, they assign me to your case. Emily snarls and releases a guttural growl like that of an angry beast. She flashes and snaps her teeth at him while pulling at the restraints holding her to the chair. She mutters under her breath and then nods. Fine. Daniel grabs her folder, stepping clear of her and writing something down inside her chart. He looks up, pleased with her uttering. Good. Glad to hear it. We'll get you started right away, then. I have noted your compliance. My administrator will be very pleased that we have reached you beyond all the walls you have erected in your head to protect yourself. The lights inside the small office flicker momentarily, accompanied by a menacing chuckle from Emily. Her voice deepens, and her face contorts briefly. We are sorry to disagree, but we're almost done. Once done here, I will move on as the Anku has business elsewhere. Daniel moves around the desk, placing it between her and himself again. He stares at Emily, a look of confusion and fear replacing his normal, arrogant demeanor. He shakes his head no. Why would you say that? We are here trying to help you with your obvious issues and to return you to a nice, normal life. Emily squirms in her chair, the irritation of his continued speech dancing on her last nerve. She laughs at the thought produced by his comment, People like me, and you to a degree, we don't get normal lives full of puppy love. We live to die. Emily examines the restraints holding her in place. She glares up at Dr. Waters from beneath her hanging bangs. She winks at him, and the restraints fall free to the floor. The reaper is now on the loose. Dr. Waters snatches the phone up and yells, She's free! Send security to my office! Emily can hear the voice of the operator call out to the doctor, Dr. Waters, they are on the way! Emily snickers at the thought of more people to play with, but shakes the thought from her head, knowing... Time is precious. She chuckles. We will never get here in time. Do you know that, right? The power surges, bursting the fluorescent bulbs inside the lights. A shower of sparks fall across the small office, illuminating the darkness. Thanks to Anku, Emily, lifting the veil, Dr. Waters can see the faces of the patients he has failed in his practice. What the hell? Emily in the chair spin to face Dr. Waters. She wears a vile grin. She glances over her shoulder, and as if directed by her will alone, the tormented spirits seize the desk and throw it against the wall. Her chart explodes upon impact with the wall and embrace the falling sparks, becoming a fiery rain. You've been a naughty boy. You have hurt a lot of people, and they are far from happy about what you did or had done to them. Their whispers have not fallen on deaf ears. We have heard their call and set them free. Dr. Waters can hear the cacophony of footfall making their way down the hallway towards his office. He grabs the door handle and pulls to force it open. He hammers on the door and yells, Get this damn door open! The whole room is catching fire! The security officers in the hallway push and thrash against the door, trying desperately to force it open. One of them opens a wall-mounted cabinet labeled, In Case of Fire, Break Glass. He pulls the fireman's axe from inside the emergency cabinet 
and rushes to the door. He yells, Stand back, Doc. I have to chop it down. Through the flames of the inferno, he can see the huddled masses of those he has wronged holding the door closed to prevent his escape. The spirits laugh and point at the man who, in life, inflicted countless torments on them. Two spirits pound against the office window until it vibrates and explodes outward. The door to the small office gives way to the desires of the security officers gathered outside seeking entry. Stand back. We'll be through it in another couple hits. Emily hears the security officers and knows she cannot allow him to escape his rightful punishment a second time. Anku shares his past with Emily showing that he escaped death at a college party, thanks to other doctors in training being present, and reviving him to save all their skins from punishment. She glares at him. No, not this time, Dr. Waters. You will not escape the punishment you're due for all your vile acts. Dr. Waters smiles and flips off Emily seeing that the fire has built between them. Neither could walk through it to reach the other. He pantomimes his thoughts as to her being crazy. The hell with you, you crazy bitch. You deserve this, not me. A large section of the door caves in under the repeated axe blows from the security officers' efforts to gain entry. They can now see into the room. We're almost there, Doc. Emily snarls and reaches out towards Dr. Waters. She clenches her fist, and he rises into the air. She jerks her arm through the air, and he gets pulled through the flames, slamming against the wall next to her. The spirits gather around him, holding him in place on the wall. The deep voice of Anku booms again from the small woman's mouth. I wear engines against the wicked for the voiceless, and you... Doctor, are wicked, I assure you. The security officers from beyond the door call out and plead with the possessed young woman. No, Emily, stop, don't hurt him. He wants to help you. Emily lowers her arms towards the floor and lowers her head. She raises her arms and clenches her hands into tight fists. The flames and embers from around the room soar through the air like thousands of fireflies gathering and clinging to Dr. Waters. The flames consume him in an unholy conflagration. Security officers cannot believe what they are witnessing. All but one flees the small office door. The last of the security staff stares at Emily and shakes his head with tears streaming down his cheeks. Why? Why, Emily? Did Anna make you into this monster? Emily turns to face the lone security officer. She sees something familiar in his appearance. With the flames now searing the carcass of the doctor, she walks to the broken remains of the door. I know you. The security officer nods as he looks at her with the eyes of a broken-hearted sibling. You did. A long time ago. We were family. Then Anna showed up. Emily's face breaks into a smile, and she covers her mouth to hide her happiness. Rodney, is that you? Rodney smiles, lowering his guard. He reaches through the hole in the door to touch his sister in hopes it will not be the last time. Yes. Now step back. I need to get this door open and set you free. Emily seizes his arm at the wrist and places his open palm against her cheek. She weeps and speaks from the heart. My time with Anku is over. Your time begins. Go to my room and take my crafts box with you. Rodney begs, Emily, let go of my arm. The fire is consuming the whole room. It will kill you. If you let me go, I can get you out of here. Emily releases his arm. She looks up at him as the fire consumes her hair first. Her strands of hair burn and coil up tight to her head. She steps backward into the flames, allowing them to consume her. I do not fear the death I am due, Rodney. Now hurry. 
and take the craft box. Rodney shakes his head and runs from the small office door. Moments later, he is standing outside of her patient room. The door stands open. He looks inside, curious to see what or who may be inside, but only sees a small, clear, plastic craft box with a blue lid. The craft box sits in the center of her bed, as if waiting for his arrival. Rodney enters the room, seeing no one inside. He takes the box in hand and hears a singular object rattle inside. His curiosity gets the better of him. I know I shouldn't, but... Rodney opens the box, seeing a single object inside, a construction paper mask painted with rainbows and butterflies. Tears well up and flow freely as memories of his time with his sister long ago fill his every thought. Am. Um, Rodney examines the mask. He weeps as he turns it around. Inside, he can make out the words, Va me fa himenzoon ango grok. Rodney tries to pronounce the words he sees. As he reads the last syllable aloud, he's forcefully spun around to face the burning animated body of his sister standing there. Emily takes him by the head, the heat from her hands scorching his temples and forehead. Rodney feels something enter him through his ears, eyes, and mouth. He screams in pain, but his voice fades away to silence. He watches as she collapses in a heap of charred flesh and pungent stench. Rodney smirks and strolls down the hallway, past a throng of firefighters rushing to put out the distant blaze. Good girl. Now the party really begins. That is one hell of an ending in Cliffhanger. Stay tuned for the powerful and emotional ending to the Stadler House series with Season 3 Rodney. But for now this is the Wicked Things Podcast signing off. Until next time. Goodbye.